Back in 2006, I never actually had a real console of my own. That honor would go to my sister, who had a GameCube and a PlayStation 2, and had more or less bought all the games for them. So, when they weren't looking, I was playing their collection without really putting much thought into what I was playing. And being so young and impressionable, those games they had were the ones I'd grown up on as a result. So much so that I never really bought games for myself and was happy with the ones I had. That all changed though, one fateful afternoon. Or at least as far as I can recall. Up until that point, I hadn't realized that our copy of Soul Calibur 3 came with a demo disc, a concept that I was wholly unaware of at the time. Not that I would have known what that even meant in the first place, since the name completely went over my 8 year old head. But, either out of sheer boredom or a simple childlike curiosity, I'd put the disc in the PS2 tray, not really knowing what to expect. But out of all the names and faces from the lineup that I would eventually come to remember, some with more fondness than others, one of the playable demos stood out to me almost immediately. A game that I had run the demo over so many times that it was the very first thing I remember consciously buying with my own money. That game was Urban Rain. Gentles and lads, my childhood. On the surface, Urban Rain doesn't seem like something that Namco themselves would make. At least for me personally, I had always associated them with bright and colorful Pac-Man in my childhood, and today with basically every anime look or license that comes out. But a brawler? Set in the XBs of New York City with themes of surveillance and government corruption? Actually, now that you mention it, that is pretty much true these days. It is an indoor air conditioner in an outdoor dining environment. So now we've added electricity. But, back when I first experienced it, Urban Rain was probably the first game I'd played that reflected a realistic-ish world, where the slums are dark and dimly lit, disasters paints the town with a sharp and foreboding crimson, a lot of other big boy things that went way over my head at the time, and the occasional sunset, making the environment glow without the overbearing bloom that plagued most games in the mid-2000s. It wasn't about cartoonish men with green caps anymore, or terrifyingly disembodied magical hands, nor was it outlandishly over-the-top street racing based than the amber hues of road lights. The closest thing that really came up to this level of realism was, ironically enough, some of the pro wrestling games of the era, which is appropriate given some of the similarities here, and that's important later. But take those heavy frame nostalgia glasses off, and you'll find that for a late PS2 game, the visuals holds up fantastically well even to this day. You can tell by this point in the system's lifespan, Namco knew how to pull off the stops in graphical presentation. The high detailed models of both the characters and the environments, yeah, clever use of base and dynamic lights that color the scene, those slick, slightly faded shadows painting the floor, and hardly an ounce of the system's seemingly trademarked low-res muddiness. And on the technical side, it's one of the few games that manages to support both 480p progressive, natural widescreen, and pulls it all off at a perfect 60 frames per second. And with this level of fidelity, that isn't something to snuff at. <laughs> nice. You could easily make the argument that graphics don't really matter in a game with such a basic premise as this one. And on the one hand, I do agree, but on the other, have you seen the way most PS2 games look in emulation? It looks great, and that's all it needs to be. And despite having that pseudo-realistic but obviously still Japanese-made look, I love the style it has. Gotta know Just because it's all in urban streets doesn't mean the color has to be a mosh pit of grays and browns. Some areas look more vibrant than others, but they still create a believable, quite lived-in atmosphere, which I'm a little more than all too nostalgic for, admittedly. And just on a side note, the character designs also deserves a mention. A lot of the concept art takes a cue from the Tekken 5 art style, which is appropriate given they came out within months of each other, and that's what the marketing would want you to believe. But I never even heard of that series when I played this, and I could still remember most of the main cast to this day just by their looks. It's a minor thing, but I don't think memorable character designs get enough credit, especially when they're going for conventional designs without getting into the realm of so dumb that it's ironically great. 
That style isn't just a looks thing either. One thing I would argue is that Urban Rain's style is the leading pillar of its design. Whether it's for good or not, flow and a sense of subtle style trumps all else in its gameplay, in ways that you might not expect for its time, but is also what makes it a unique experience to this day. Let me explain. Urban Rain is a beat-em-up, but not in the traditional sense. Most people, when they hear beat-em-up, might think of the 2D belt scrollers from the 90s, or retro throwbacks in the teens and 20s. You probably already know the ones, like Streets of Rage, Final Fight, pretty much any of Konami's arcade games of the time. They all follow a very similar and streamlined formula. Scrolling until the screen locks in place, flanking enemies by walking into their lanes, very simple combat and attack chains, and maybe a screen-filling super of some sort. That's not what this is though, as it's entirely three-dimensional and the only limits are those set by the stage. There were plenty of three-dimensional evolutions of the genre around the time though, like Devil May Cry and God of War, but those are what are categorized as character action games. Similarly in a 3D space, but where it normally gives the player significantly more mobility options, like jumps and time dodges, combo ratings, and is generally a much faster pace of game, Urban Rain is also nothing like that. Rather than holding itself to the limitations of the 2D brawler, or going all out with the flashier productions of its brethren, UR takes an approach somewhere in the middle. It's a slower, more grounded take on the genre, with a control scheme that is streamlined enough that you can effectively play it with a Sega Saturn controller, but with enough nuance that makes combat more of an action puzzler than its contemporaries. You only have four main buttons, the strike, grapple, run, and a dodge button. Strikes are what you would expect, punches and kicks that can be chained in four different ways by tilting a stick towards any of the cardinal directions. Grapples, then, are the throw maneuvers when you get close to an enemy. Running not only lets you pick up the pace, but it can also be used to perform dash attacks and let the character run up both walls and the people around them, which themselves can also be chained into air strikes and air grapples. Most of the hard work of aiming is done for you with a fairly generous soft lock-on that can also be held for a direct targeting radical that lets you lock strafe around your target. Said soft lock can be a little overzealous at times about who it's targeting, but the manual lock makes this much easier and aiming at what you want generally isn't a problem. Every attack inflicts regional damage indicated by this helpful skeleton that, while definitely not fighting, will react to what region's being hit, and more importantly, when it's irreparably damaged. Both strikes and throws are countered by the same deflection button, and this is easily the defining maneuver of the combat system. Every single attack, throw, or other advance on your character can be avoided with careful timing of the counter button, or if you're airborne, quickly recover from any potential juggling so you're back on your feet. You can think of the different kinds of moves as a sort of weapon or attacks triangle. Strikes will usually take priority over grapples, grapplers will throw off serial dodgers, and dodges will go right through strikes with careful attention. Each segment of combat has strategic advantages and openings that gives each a utility in the veritable sandbox Urban Rain presents. And beneath all of this is the wild card of the system. Spas, no really, that's what they're called in the game, are the exact opposite of relaxing. Right underneath the gaming typical life bar is a spotted gauge that fills up over the course of fighting, and is fueled by most everything you do in battle. Striking, grappling, countering, and even taking damage all fills the spa gauge by different amounts, and by pressing the strike and grapple buttons together, special attacks can be unleashed in relation to the direction being held. Down specials activate what's called a status effect, aka the character unique power-up that grants one of, or a number of perks depending on the user. Specials cannot be deflected at all, save for using one of your own to abuse the iframes it lends. So if you're on the receiving end of one of these, you better get used to the piano rolling dodge maneuver to get away. Special attacks are the second most defining aspect of combat, as the effects they have on battle can be massive if used at the optimal time, while also effectively stopping the fight from becoming a loop of mindless deflection back and forth. Sometimes. However, counter and grapple specifically could be a major pain point for players, due to what could be considered an oversight. According to both the manual and the tutorial in-game, throws are countered by 
matching the directional input with the region the opponent is aiming at. While this might sound obvious, in practice, there's a bit of nuance that can make this incredibly overwhelming, if not nearly impossible to gauge in the heat of battle. No. Because every throw is going to be different, knowing what region is actually being aimed at, and thus what direction to press in retaliation, is extremely difficult to tell at times. Certain characters seem to take advantage of this by making some throw animations intentionally similar, or throwing them off by starting to look like it's going to attack the head, when really they're flipping you over to toss you on your back. Now, if you're me, then you're probably wondering, why are you just now making this video? No. Doesn't this remind you of a different game? I'd played a few games before Urban Rain, and one of the ones that immediately stood out as similar is a little GameCube game called WWE Day of Reckoning. Yuxa's fighting systems that were used in Reckoning used a very similar style of input. Attacks or throws could be countered by mashing one of the shoulder buttons at the exact moment they would land, leading to either outright dodging or blocking and countering your opponent's moves with one of your own. But rather than using one button and suddenly deciding to use a different mechanic depending on the kind of attack, throw deflection is simply dedicated to the opposite shoulder button for simplicity. It really only matters if your countering is an attack or a throw, so it's immediately more intuitive that way. Urban Rain really could have used a change to the way this worked. Maybe the option for an indicator to appear that shows what input should be followed, perhaps with the already existing practice mode or a toggle for beginners, or since the character models already flash to indicate a correctly timed counter, why not use that to maybe flicker the respective region of the character that's being aimed at? It can still be reactionary and keep the single button design while keeping the subtle stylish look. Anything would be better than this guesswork, really. Minor setbacks aside, the way I'm describing it sounds so simple, but in practice, the way these mechanics flow together changes the dynamic of the game entirely, from being a linear, rock'em sock'em kind of combat loop, to a much more frenetic, reactionary system of figuring out attack patterns, gauging hitboxes and distancing, and playing genuine mind games with the opponent if they're smart enough. No, seriously, even the AI bots on a high enough difficulty will themselves start trying to juke you into attacking if you're close enough. And getting a strike chain memorized enough that you can slip right through like it's nothing is another factor into what makes Urban Rain so satisfying to play. When rolled together into a single package, all of these mechanics together creates a microcosm of strategies. This makes for, dare I say it, very emergent gameplay that can evolve what would otherwise be very conventional fighting scenes. These emergent gameplay moments, from the excessive dodge juke mind games, to the management of special energy, to the environment itself sometimes, all these factors combine into a challenging, maybe even too difficult, but fair and debatably balanced fighting system that's far more substantial than its 2D brethren, while being generally easier to grapple and adjust to while being just as difficult to master as the character action stuff. It's all very nuanced, in ways that can remind you of the Soulsborns, also games published by Bandai Namco, funnily enough. A very similar risk versus reward paradigm can lead to many, usually easily avoidable deaths, but also make for a very satisfying ending when you just barely edge out a win from purely your own skill reflexes and maybe a bit of luck. It might be a difficult concept to grasp, and maybe even inaccessible to some who can't handle it, and that's fair and justifiable in those cases, it's not for everyone. But for those who find the thrill of challenge appealing, Urban Rain's core gameplay is ahead of its time in that respect. Respect. What ties this combat system together in a neat little bow is the fact that not only are you capable of all these maneuvers, but your enemies too. After all, they're not just generic one-punch mooks, but actual characters that can be played as and against. So every individual character has some or more of these elements to their advantage to make them just as viable as the main playable command. Some characters have fast but very straightforward combos that can be timed rhythmically. The other more powerful guys hit much harder, but also also have a wind-up to their swings. Some don't even try to combo, but instead go for chipping at the opposition for an opening to grapple, and others will intentionally stagger their movements to make them more unpredictable and harder to dodge. These differences are benefited even more by multiple fighting styles, with some shared within certain factions, but all the major playable command having a whole unique style that affects their strikes, preferences, and even movement to match their background. While critics at the time bemoaned the lack of extreme style in the face of the ever-popular God of War 2 and Devil May Cry 3, and perhaps rightfully so, I think that's missing the point a little bit. 
Urban Rain is a different kind of game in the genre, and it was never meant to be necessarily comparable to what would become the character action game. If anything else, and it's a bit of a deep cut, it's far more comparable to something like Sega's Spike Out series, as short-lived as it was, in that it's more of an extension to the belt-scrolling brawler, while not exactly replacing it, but also not replacing the mechanics wholesale either. Rather, it's a mix of what the game's not only considered retro, but also a glimpse into what could have been the future of the genre in their nice. eyes. And I am of the belief that Urban Rain was exactly this to the 3D brawler, especially when the only other things comparable at the time were generally clunky, if not downright awfully genre confused. Cybernetically enhanced. Man, we have the technology, we will screw up this game. For Christ's sake, oh, you can't no. even turn around. Turn it, the controls are no, nothing less than god awful. And the only, yeah, that's the only th good thing right here. You're looking at it, folks. You hold your gat sideways. <laughs> it's a poor attempt to be like a cool, a good John yeah, cool movie. That's, that's the room. only good thing about this game. <laughs> So, while I generally disagree with the public perception when Urban Rain was released, act surprised when as a fairly seasoned Souls enjoyer and has been gaming for most of their life on games like this, that when I see people saying this game somehow lacks depth compared to Soul Calibur and Tekken, I squint my eyes and ask, what? There's almost certainly a difference in perspective, I realize, and you may or may not agree with the points I make, but one thing I will agree with those reviews, however, is that the game surrounding this loop is lacking substance. Nobody's innocent. My name is Brad Hawk. I'm a professional. I do things my way. Rain's main story is the weakest link that ties this gameplay together, mostly because it doesn't tie anything at all. Now, after getting done talking about a system that's about arcade action, it might seem weird talking about the story all of a sudden and acting like it's a problem. But hold that thought just for a second. This game boasts a 100 level campaign, although really it's 99, but there's a serious problem with the structure of it, or rather the lacking thereof. When you compare the narrative to the main gameplay that it's attached to, and trying to bridge that together, it's nearly everything opposite to what that part was aiming for. Disjointed, confused, a little drawn out, and a little aimless. Hey. The Ragtown region of Green Harbor that Urban Rain takes place in is really trying hard to emulate the grime and corruption of what a modern day New York could be, or basically has become at this point. Me documenting the world as it becomes more and more of a meme. And at face value, it tries to say something about surveillance, the power of money, greed, government corruption, but it feels woefully undercooked in a few ways. The kidnapping at the beginning that sparks the war between the major gangs of the city is a compelling way to set the stage for what's to come, but that napping of kids which sets the whole thing off is sort of forgotten about after three missions. Hey, where's KG? We know he in there! Yeah, come on out here! <sighs> I think I nabbed one of their boys. All the way until the end of the first act, when the dust settles with the gang victimized by this. Only for the real perp to literally ride in at the last minute, almost as if on cue set by the story, where the next two major factions walk right in to make a mess of the town. They cause such a riot, more than any of the rest of the gangs up until this point, that the power goes out on the map, and the atmosphere is decrepit and more ominous compared to before. But there really isn't a city to necessarily be worried about among all of this. Almost immediately at the start, these gates block off all the roadways for people to come through, hardly even pretending it's a thinly veiled excuse to explain the battle locales being locked off. There are character moments, but those only go as far as brief 5 second interludes that introduce the rest of the cast, Amazing. and they're done with just as quickly as it happened. There's some moments every so often that could have been part of at least a more interesting narrative, if only these were linked together by something less static than a wall of text that briefs every mission. It's almost as if it's got the idea there, but it isn't executed executed very far beyond that. The scope is missing, for all the good it does at making diverse characters and fun and emergent gameplay and interesting environments to look at. There's hardly a background to set all of this up against that links it all together. And that's where the disconnect is for me, and makes it harder to sit through when most of the missions are identical across the 99 or so long campaign. One of them's not even a member of the Zaps, but I'm pissed off. So if he gets in the way, well, that's his problem. 
all the objectives are about as simple as you could get considering the setup. Uh, some are more interesting than others, but most end up being elimination with the occasional caveat like a fairly generous time limit, dispersing a group by taking out the commanding foe, or busting up the enemy's body by continuously kicking them in the dick. The missions in the second act onward are probably most let down by the way the partner mechanic is handled, but not in the way that you would expect. Your friends in crime aren't necessarily dumb or incompetent, even if they can sure act like some of the most mid-2000s act dummies sometimes. But their behavior is still mostly head and shoulders above most any other escort you'd have to contend with. Partners can be extremely helpful, since they can perform team maneuvers that are both powerful and grant invincibility frames in the process. But when they want to let themselves die, sometimes they just will. And you don't have many options to command them either, despite the game telling you that you can and should issue your commands clearly and wisely. You can't do any of that. How can you be clear and wise with just two buttons? Still, them being there means you can switch to controlling them at any point, but that directly leads into the main problem. If Brad Hawk dies, and specifically only Brad Hawk dies, that is a fail. Aside from the green escort missions, where either member aren't allowed to die at all, the party's own life is seemingly attached by some Hawkian blood ritual to his own. I can only assume that this is an oversight, but whether intentional or not, this limitation uncharacteristically locks away some strategies that could have been viable had either partner been allowed to kick the bucket and continue fighting. Despite all the problems, is the whole campaign bad? No, not at all. There is some real merit to the story, even if it isn't from the storyline itself. Hey yo, what's your problem, huh? For one, duels are appropriately common and serve as somewhat of boss encounters in the story, usually against some of the main story characters. And the combat is so flowful when it's allowed some room to breathe because of these encounters, letting the mechanics simply work to create intense battles. Crank these up to very hard and you'd be surprised just how genuinely tripped up you can get from fighting these guys. Which is odd seeing as this is Namco we're talking about. They're usually the kings of making some of these mono e mono fights feel very clunky and awkward, particularly particularly in some of their RPGs, and yet here, it's the total opposite. Speaking generally, and despite my complaining about how aimless it might feel, I do enjoy the changes between the first and second acts. There is a real transition here. You're only fighting run-of-the-mill hoodlums to start, some serious ballas like real deal in NC. Uh -huh, yeah. And the all-star cast of these high school portrait faces give a lot, if not unintentionally funny meme material. They're all fairly low-ranking punks all around. The most threatening thugs are the shirtless boxer and the main cast that starts to pop up occasionally. But once the real threats come into town though, and the lights come off, the rogues gallery gets significantly more dangerous, there's actual sinister intent, and they become more morally dubious as you climb up the ranks. It's a subtle progression in the threat of foes, which is appreciated as it makes the fights that much more rewarding to conquer. One of the main targets of the second act is Napalm 99, one of the ex-convicts that leads the charge of terror on the city. Hey. It's pretty funny how the first time you're meeting him is you making the jump after they've gotten a bite to eat. And it just so happens that his status effect special is not just strength and super armor, but also a small healing factor. Is this the effect of the food he just ate? Or did Napalm really just stuff a bunch of burgers down his trousers? And wait, since we just saw the city getting destroyed by these guys, and the aesthetic is absolutely ruined by this point in the story. Where is he even getting these infinite Musée shopping cart of treats worth of sandwiches from? Well, by the end of the second act, Napalm and his friend Doug McDonald's is gone and dusted. Until a whole other faction of goons literally walks right in, almost like they were also nearly late and the story roped them in on stage at the last second. And this is probably the part where the fatigue unfortunately sets in the most, as the convicts are still causing trouble and McDoug Kinsey over here continues popping up like a photobomber at an anniversary party. One of the good things about this third arc, though, is one specific enemy that is introduced at this point. Golem. Golem. Uh, oh. It's... Gollum? That doesn't sound right. Has it always been pronounced Gollum? I always pronounced it Gollum. Gollum. Yeah, Gollum. Gollum. 
Google wouldn't lie to me. The hulking brute with the striking scar and tattoos all over. He's clearly framed to be this force of nature, bearing some of the highest stats that hits and takes hits like an absolute tank. He also happens to serve as a rival for much of the third act, and at first you have a friend to help take him down, but that does nothing to alleviate the monstrous theme of his that plays, which is probably the most unique musical piece of the game for how intense and brutal of vibes it gives off. But easily the most memorable moment for me is the few missions afterwards where you're forced to go up against him alone. The same theme music of his is much more subdued this time. It's muddied and almost has a ghostly vibe to it, as the steel drum kit pounds away from what feels like the great beyond. Up until he activates his effect, anyways. The way the electric guitar ramps up and down with the ebbs and flows of the battle, as this dump truck comes charging at you with a devastating fire axe and throws that can three or two shot you. I definitely shot myself the first time I played this when I was nine, and even today, he gives me no less shit nearly 20 years later. This is the most kind of Dark Soulsian moment, and finally cheesing him enough that he was on the floor is still one of the most satisfying wars of attrition that I've ever experienced. And Namco must have agreed, since he shows up another three times. It starts to get a little ridiculous by the fifth showing, I'm not going to lie. It's around this point, then, that the narrative decides to return to the forefront again, as what are the usual mission briefings are now replaced by a much different and more threatening voice. <laughs> but you've still got questions, right? Well, I've got your answers. But you'll need to get yourself over to Green Hill. Oh no. He couldn't possibly mean. Now it's Shun's brother Lin Fong deciding to start mocking you in a much more direct way that no other part of the story had done so far. Ironically enough, despite sending you into death traps intentionally alone, this is the most direction that the story has gotten now, as the sibling rivalry gives the two some actual character and a relationship. Sort of loosely parallel to the way Golems Golem. become a rival to the player, in a way. And his team up with the Biggie Man is appropriately tense as a result. Well, until you realize that Linny Lin's a bit of a bitch compared to his tanky friend. Finally, as the narrative closes in on a clearer objective, and after one more fight with Burger Balm and Shut up! the real threat and head to the head of all the trouble in the city is just kind of introduced at the last minute without any fanfare. Despite Shinkai being easily the coolest duel encounter of the entire game, taking place in a steel cage roof arena with this blinding sunset to his back, he has literally no fanfare, almost as if he was also rushed into the plot along with the rest of the cast. But after taking down the Japanese god card of the game, it's all done. It's over. Except it isn't, because of this little breadcrumb conveniently dropped down Shin's pants. And now, cue one of those moments. You know the ones. The endgame lore dump where all the pieces come together, brought to you by this briefing that is so long that the slow automatic text crawl gets outrun by the voiceover, so you have to manually scroll it. Not only does this look and feel rather clumsy on its own, but the fact that this happens after what could have just been the real final boss character, especially IS the real final boss character, and the fact that this presumably happened several days after without much of any indicator as to the timing of this, without any other event tying these threads together, it's not great. But the mission that comes after might just make up for it a little. I haven't had a chance to talk much about the music in general, and that's for a good reason. For all the weird story choices, contrasting the brilliantly styled gameplay, Rain's soundtrack is just fine. Uh -huh, yeah. It sets the mood appropriately enough, more often than not. Some tunes are definitely more memorable than others, but in a direction reminiscent of Sonic Adventure 2, ah! there's a bit of an overemphasis on rock music, and specifically the electric guitar plays a lead role in many of these tracks. It isn't bad, by any means, but but it can be fatiguing, especially by the second act, when most of the repeated themes become grungy rock. Some of my favorites happen to be the other genres, like when the bass guitar is given the spotlight for once.
the main riff in particular gets used for a many of the pivotal moments or bosses. But, case and point, my favorite play on the leap motif is the one that's used in the final cutscene. Hmm. So, you're the guy I've been hearing so much about. <laughs> it's refreshing when the rushing rock beats calms down for once to get a little bit more introspective at all that's happened thus far. Brawn and brains. This should be right up your alley. <laughs> After spending so long without saying a word since the third mission, Brad is finally given his speaking role, and it might just be my favorite line here. And this piece of paper with your signature on it? Probably won't prove anything. Maybe I can put it up for sale on the internet. If only this was the real modern-day New York, this might have actually been made a little funnier. But not just that. The actual boss against Borden is really fun -ny. He's essentially this game's version of the guy with the gun, and if you let yourself get shot, you won't make it out alive. But he only has 15 rounds to shoot off, which can easily be juked through, leaving him to stare defenselessly as he laughs maniacally. <laughs> The dude goes down in one throw. What a bitch. And just like that, that's the campaign. Brad sending his goodbyes like the loner he is, and the ending shot mirroring the very first mission like a cute bookend. The story isn't completely wasted, it lacks a lot of vision at the start, and it kinda loses what's left by the end, but it's like a roller coaster. It has its highs and lows that makes it memorable, and it's no coincidence that the best moments are the ones that are served by the gameplay as an environmental storytelling device. Maybe I'm the only one who notices, but the small flourishes make up for a lot of the low points set by the actual plot, whatever amount of it is there by the finish line anyways. Huh? That just speaks to the power of subtle environmental storytelling. Even if Brad only has a total of eight speaking lines outside of the intro, and for that matter, none of the English voice actors are even credited, only the Japanese ones. Fun fact, the production company behind this game, PCB, still does work to this day. You might know them best for their work on the seminal classic, Call of Duty Ghosts. Dog models. Nowadays though, their site continues to be pretty vague about their involvement with this game. The only other indicator seems to be that it might have actually been planned to release on the Xbox. Oh, how I wish that to be true. Thankfully, the end of the campaign isn't necessarily the end of the game though. From here, free play and challenge modes open up, which, depending on how you look at it, is where the real meat of the game is. Free mode is exactly what the name implies, playing individual campaign missions as you please at any pace. The roster then opens up, giving you free reign to play as whomever in any map. While this could have been left as a throwaway ad, like the rest of the game, there is another layer beneath the surface to consider, the ranking system. Your performance is graded at the end of every mission, mostly revolving around time, damage taken, partners down, and recovery items used if any, and your longest combo string. Alongside the difficulty of simply surviving, now add in the challenge of getting the most consecutive hits without getting damaged yourself, which not only breaks flow, but now also starts the meter back at zero. And while at face value, this could mean you could abuse the strongest character you have with the optional maximizer toggle, this wouldn't grant you optimal rankings because of the character multiplier. Every character is given a star rating, so the scoring system actually incentivizes using lower ranked characters for the best scores. This means that there are different strategies you can take to get optimal scores for those coveted S ranks. You could tackle each mission at the hardest difficulty using your top top 5 star tier characters. Or, if you're feeling confident, you can challenge at a lower difficulty but using a lower tier character for that multiplier. After all, bad defense wouldn't matter as much if you can avoid getting hit in the first place, right? Now granted, some approaches work better than others in some stages, and on the maps with predetermined partners you can't change, you may feel pressured to go for the hardest difficulty to compensate. Some of my favorite characters to use for the extra modes are the Gauss Fighters, which are unlocked pretty quickly by completing 
cleaning the first act. Three and two star femmes who share a lot of similarity and are even related to some of the main cast, despite never making an appearance elsewhere. Lillian is easily my main pick of the lot. It could be the cute look or the exposed midriff, the fact that she's the only character with a flip jump, the way that she's so short that she sometimes completely ignores the physical plane of hitboxes, or how she yelps like a cat when getting hurt. <laughs> The lower base stats might seem anemic, and that's because they are, and in some stages, it really can be a death sentence if you aren't prepared. But Lillian and Kelly also have the concentration status effect, which auto-deflects everything. It even deflects deflected throws, which makes evading and baiting attacks a legitimate and very effective, albeit risky strategy, since more consecutive counters means consecutively more spa gauge for you while depleting your enemies. It all adds up to more incentive for aiming at as high a combo chain as you can get. That risk reaps even greater rewards, and it is immensely satisfying to make it through a map nearly flawlessly for that coveted S rank. And that is to say, you don't even need to be necessarily perfect, just good enough that you have an understanding of the mechanics and knowing how to make all of those tricks work in your favor. Unlocked alongside free play is the challenge mode, which only adds up to a series of fights against up to 50 characters. Not really survival, either, since no matter how much life or limb damage you take, you're as good as new come the next fight. It's easy to forget about this after doing the minimum 10 rounds just to get Paul. And about those Tekken guests? They honestly are a great fit for this kind of game. Out of all the Namco games, especially in recent years, that tend to use cameos for a cheap bit of nostalgia bait, it's refreshing to have some of these references actually fit the mood and aesthetic of the game they're put in. Uh, though Law's voice seems... compressed. Multiplayer is also featured, which would be a crime not to have in a game like this. Go at it with any of the cast unlocked with up to 4 people or computer filler in 7 stages. There are other modes besides normal fighting, but unfortunately they require at least a second real person, so I couldn't try them. But the other modes would include variations of a King of the Hill or Domination style, where weapon hoarding is the key, and an objective space match about either destroying or throwing your opponent into a key object owned by the opposite team. Sort of like two-way capture the flag, but more like destroying the flag more than anything. On top of the multiplayer modes that it gives you, there is also a secret third mode that's only unlockable via a cheat code. Remember when games used to have these? Put this code in the title, and now all of the co-op missions in either story or free play can be played with a friend as the partner, assuming there is one. While this seems really cool in premise, there is a problem here. Certain other cooperative games of the time didn't tend to follow the playable characters well, and only opted to track the leader exclusively. And unfortunately, the same is true here. Even if another player is joining, the camera exclusively follows the first player. No display cut, not even any distant camera panning. So while co-op might be an option, I think there's a good reason it's hidden behind a cheat code. I'm not that vain to ignore that this video could be summed up as just some song bemoaning how his childhood game wasn't actually as good as he remembered. But whereas most nostalgia games tend to come and go about as quickly as they're remembered, Urban Rain manages to stand tall among my collection even to this day. The core fighting mechanics continues to flow just as well, if not a little better than the day I first met it, and age hasn't done a thing to dampen my enjoyment either. It brings back such good, much simpler memories of what games used to be about, when they had substantial content, large rosters, and the potential to be something special without relying on live services online connectivity, and those godforsaken battle passes. Because it didn't need those! It seems like Urban Rain did enjoy some marketing, but the game seemingly went overlooked since most of the wiki sources are incredibly bare. And whereas most of the critics were mixed or even panned the game at the time, and rightfully so in some respects, the people who actually bought and played it near universally praised it just for its gameplay alone. There's clearly some fans out there for you are. In fact, take this into consideration. While the artists came from Tekken and Soul Calibur 2, the lead developers hadn't actually worked on the game before. So all that marketing that was hyper fixated on it being made by the creators of Soul Calibur and Tekken is a little disingenuous. But rather than settling with making a budget title and leaving nice. it at that, this fresh blood made a bonafide classic. That deserves some credit. 
and just because I'm finding the campaign as it was somewhat repetitive, it shouldn't undermine how excellent that central brawling gameplay loop is, and just how underutilized this streamlined, more nuanced style of arcade fighting truly is in the modern gaming landscape. This is an underappreciated style that, in an age of retro throwback beat-em-ups and especially more difficult games for the harder core in the last few years, I think Urban Rain could have another chance today with either its story being fleshed out to better complement the gameplay, or scoping in solely on the mechanics that allows it to stand as one of the pillars that gaming is truly about. It is, in my humble opinion, what 3D brawlers could have been, had this style not been almost completely overshadowed by either the 2D likes of Turtles & Co, or the over-the-top stylish fighters that Dante, Bayonetta, and others have cemented as being staples of the genre. Of course, those games have their place and are immensely enjoyable for their own reasons, but there could could also be room for something in the middle. We don't get enough of those that try for something different, and I think people deserve to have a little more nuance in today's gaming landscape. And that is all there is to be said. Until the next video, whenever that may be, love yourself and everyone around you, and thanks for watching.